Let's continue in worship as we hear God's word together. Listen now as I read from John 21. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go out with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they'd finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to Thanks God. Be to God. We've been hearing the wonderful stories of how Jesus met with those after his resurrection. We heard about Mary Magdalene and her encounter with Christ in the garden. And last week about two people walking the road to Emmaus. And today about this encounter on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. A little while after that first Easter revelation in the garden, the disciples, Jesus' followers and friends, were gathered together. And scripture tells us that Jesus came and stood among them. Scripture actually records that this occurred twice, with Thomas being the central character in these accounts. But Peter was there too. We have to remember what's been happening with Peter. On the night before Jesus died, Peter had done exactly what Jesus had told him he would do. And the very thing that Peter said he would never do. He had denied that he was a follower of Christ. After Jesus died, Peter must have been crushed by the weight of his grief and the weight of his own denial. And it was only now, in the first confusing days that Jesus is back, that he started to understand what all that meant. Jesus was permanently resurrected, and it, it was and is amazing. Christ is alive, but Peter's heart, Peter's heart is still heavy. His mind remembers all too clearly being in the courtyard the night that Jesus was arrested. He recalled how he tried to get closer. He was afraid, and he tried to be inconspicuous. He remembered the girl at the fire, of her turning and saying, you are one of them, and how quick and easily. He said, I do not know the man. 
And almost unconsciously, this happened three times. And one way or another, he denied the Lord. If only, now he was thinking. On that third denial, as the cock was crowing, Jesus' eyes found Peter. Now, Peter might not have even realized that Jesus knew that he was there in the crowd. But with that third betrayal, his eyes broke through the crowd and found Peter. And their eyes met. They saw each other. And as the darkness was closing around Jesus, Peter retreated from the light of the fire and into the darkness where he wept bitterly at his failure. But that was days ago, even weeks by now. And a lot has happened. Things that no one could have predicted. Still, if you're Peter and Jesus is back, and you have denied him, how awkward would that be? Can you imagine what it must have been like, what he must have been thinking? What am I going to say when I see Jesus? Recall that among the twelve, Peter was in that select group with James and John. Scripture tells us that Peter told the others, I'm going fishing. We get it. He probably needed to do something to clear his head. And they had nothing particular to do. A few of them go out in their boats and they throw nets out again and again. And each time they pull them up, they find nothing. As the dawn breaks, a man on the beach cries out, Have you caught any fish? It seems a common small talk question down through the ages even to the solo fishermen with the rod by the riverside. These fishermen, they've been out all night. They were frustrated, and so when the man on the beach suggested that they put their nets down on the other side, they could have easily thought, having done that many times through the night, well, that's an original idea. But for some reason, he suggested to them, and they did it, and look what happened. The nets are filled with fish. And that's when they realize the man standing on the shore is no longer a stranger. Can you imagine Peter at that moment? This is the moment he's been waiting for and so unsure of how he's going to handle. He sees Jesus there and he doesn't even wait for the boat to head back. He jumps into the water and goes to the shore to meet Jesus there. After they are all at shore and Jesus has asked for some of the catch, Peter brings some of the fish. We can see them on the beach gathered around those charcoal embers that were burning. Peter is nervously ready for the first real face-to-face, eye-to-eye conversation that we know of with Jesus since the other gathering by the fire in the temple courts. And it's this part of the story that we're always struck by. When Peter gets there, Jesus doesn't yell at him. He doesn't chastise him for his lack of faith or call him a coward. He doesn't tell him to get lost, that he had his chance. Instead, he says this, Come and have breakfast. It must have reminded Peter of Jesus' first invitation to him years before, to come and see. Come and share with me and see what God is up to. Sometimes we wonder if we have a hard time talking about our relationship with Jesus, not because of what it will sound like to others, but because of how unsettling that kind of intimacy can be. It's a little easier to talk about the Creator God who made everything and who's so very different from us, maybe even distant. But it's harder to talk about someone who actually lived as one of us and felt the same feelings as all of us and who knows the truth about each of us, good and bad, and who still loves us anyway. In Jesus, God becomes human. God becomes like us. And we're able to know God not as the boss who gives us orders, not the God, the lawyer, with a bunch of statutes and rules for us to follow neatly bound together, Not even God the Heavenly Father, but God standing there on the beach cooking breakfast, there in their familiar place near the water. Now, if Jesus showed up in our kitchen, we'll be honest, we wouldn't 
be asking what was for breakfast. We'd probably be so dumbfounded that we wouldn't know what to say. And I think that's normal because relationships can be hard, even when it's just us everyday people. But having a real relationship with Jesus, with God incarnate in you, that's a whole different level. And yet Jesus showed us what that can be like because he invited Peter to breakfast. Can you imagine that? You expect to be persona non grata, and instead you get breakfast. The one, the very one that you deny, the one who knows the worst about you isn't angry. He doesn't reject you. Instead, he's cooking you fish to eat and telling you to pull up a seat at his table. And he loves you. All that stuff from the past, all the mistakes, they don't matter. He loves you. And maybe that's the surprising, most surprising part of all. The fact that we are loved no matter what. The conviction that grace is real. And that we can't somehow mess up so badly that we lose it. The first time that we really understand this, that no matter what God we do, that God still loves us, it's actually overwhelming. Knowing that God's grace was for us and for everyone is overwhelming. But then it's profoundly freeing. Because God's love went for something you and I didn't have to earn. All we had to do was to let it in and believe that we are loved. That's amazing. But it's also not the end of the story. Because Jesus' love does not depend on us. We can choose what to do with it. We can choose to do nothing. We can choose to accept it and not really think about it much. But when you are truly loved, and you know you are truly loved, can, can you really do nothing? Well, we obviously think the answer to that is no. Because we think that love always transforms us. And we think that when we know we are loved, we are never the same again. And we think that Peter knew that too. Jesus called him Simon, son of John, which got Peter's attention. He had not been called that for a long time, we think. That was, after all, the name he had before he met Jesus. Jesus, at their meeting, had given him a new name, Peter, and called him the rock on which Christ would build his church. It's almost like Jesus is reminding Peter of all the things from the very beginning. We can imagine Jesus asking him the question for the first time as they were having lunch. Simon, son of John, do you love me? more than these? Now before Peter would have said he would have died for him. But today Peter responds, Lord, you know that I love you. And maybe there's silence. And then Jesus says, feed my lambs. We see it the second time and perhaps Jesus is putting his food down and looking more intently at Peter. And he asks him again, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter again replies, you know that I love you. And again, a life-fulfilling opportunity is offered as he says, feed my sheep. Do you think that Peter, in his mind, saw that third question coming? Three denials, three professions. Even if he did know it was coming, still it was going to hurt. And then in his reply, he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. 
We think this is a little bit like what following Jesus is like, and it happens again and again. We say we're strong in the faith that we will not stray, that we know Christ is Lord. We're for real. You and I say we understand taking up our cross and following. 40 days in the wilderness, you get it. You understand. And then you and I fail. An old vice or an old habit, or we discover in our life that we're not as forgiving as we thought, not as level-headed as we thought, not as open to others as we thought, or we lose our temper, or we lose our focus, and we end up feeling cold and bitter or ashamed. What Bible story do you live in? into? Which story gives you hope, shows you the way back home? Maybe it's the empty tomb with Jesus meeting you there. Maybe it's the father running to meet you, the prodigal. Or maybe now it's thinking of sitting by a fire eating fish and breaking bread that you remember he loves you. Why is that we so quickly forget that? Jesus untwists our shame and he asks us, do you love me? And he will then say, feed my sheep, or as we might say it, take care of my people and guide them. Jesus asked Peter three times. I don't think that's because Jesus didn't believe him. I think it was because Peter didn't really believe himself. And so Jesus asked him three times if he loves him and in those questions, there's a certain grace, an assurance that as many times as we run away, God will call us back just as many times. Whether it's three or 300 or 3,000, God will always ask us to return in love. Now, when we think of the great heroes of the church, Peter is up there near the top. The guy who ran away from Jesus on the night he was betrayed was the same guy who ran and jumped into the water, ran to shore when he saw him again. And he was the one that Jesus was still saying, you are the rock upon whom I will build my church. And also remember that Jesus gave them a sign from their past of fishing and casting their nets when they were out there overflowing with fish. And it's also a sign for us into our future. The great astounding abundance of the kingdom of which we are now a part. And to God be the glory. Amen. Amen. Join me now in our affirmation of faith. This is the gospel which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved, if we hold it fast, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared first to the women, then to Peter, and to the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen.